What's up my stats stars? Michael Princhuk here, ready to help you start preparing for the AP Statistics exam in May. In this video, I wanna walk you through a couple multiple choice questions that cover collecting data, which usually make up around 12 to 15% of all the multiple choice questions on the exam. And these questions are the ones that most students get right because they're actually pretty easy, the topics aren't too difficult, and there's not really any math to do at all. So let's start taking a look at them now. Now, when it comes to solving multiple choice questions out of unit three for collecting data, the good news is there's no formulas. There's no mathematical formulas you have to have memorized that you're gonna to put to use. But there are a ton of concepts in unit three when it comes to sampling, understanding bias, experimental design, and all of those concepts are not all gonna be on the exam, let's be honest, but some of them will. So I'm gonna go over some problems with you right now that cover a lot of them, but again, not all of them. But that's kind of the negative thing is there's a lot of things that you do have to know because you got to be prepared for any of it. All right, so let's take a look at the first multiple choice question here. A bank surveyed all of its 60 employees to determine the proportions who participate in volunteer activities, which of the following statements is true. Now, key thing is, whether you realize or not, they were looking at all their employees. That means they did a census. So which of the following are true? The bank should not use the data from the survey because it's an observational study. No, not at all. Observational studies are great. They can give us lots of information and all they were trying to figure out was what proportion participate in volunteer activities. So that has nothing to do with it. The bank can use the results of this survey to prove that working for the bank causes employees to participate in volunteer activities. Absolutely not. They were not looking at two different things. They were not doing an experiment where they could actually show A causes B. So not at all. The bank did not select a random sample of employees, so the survey will not provide the bank with useful information. Okay, that's true. They did not select a random sample of employees, but they selected all of its employees. So that's going to provide exactly the information that they're looking for. So that's not going to be the choice either. D, the bank would have to use the survey data to construct a confidence interval in order to estimate the proportion of employees who participate in volunteer activities. Well, I mean, they could, but why would they do that? A confidence interval is when you do not know the population proportion, you're trying to find it. They measured all of their 60 employees and they got the proportion of them that volunteer in, in, in activities. So they have it. They have the true P that they need. So the bank does not need to use an inference procedure to determine the proportion of employees who volunteer activities because the survey was a census of all its employees. So E is the correct answer here. So it's like we learn all this stuff about inference and how we can use samples to make estimates about populations, but then we kind of tricky here by saying, hey, we're doing a census, and if we're doing a census, there's no need for inference whatsoever. So kind of a tricky question, but hopefully you caught that they did measure all employees. Not too bad then. All right, next question is a compact disc CD manufacturer wanted to determine which of two different cover designs for a newly released CD will generate more sales. I feel like this question is very outdated because nobody even buys CDs anymore. All right, the manufacturer chose 70 stores to sell the CD. 35 of these stores were randomly signed to sell CDs with one of the cover designs, and the other 35 were signed to sell the CDs with the other cover design. The manufacturer recorded the number of CDs sold at each of the stores and found a significant difference between the mean number of CDs sold for the two covered designs. Which of the following gives the conclusion that should be used based on the results and provides the best explanation for the conclusion? All right, so for this one, we're really thinking that at the end of the day, we have two samples. We have a sample of 35 stores, and from that sample that used, you know, cover one, we had a mean. And then from the sample that used cover two, they also had a mean, and they noted that there is a significant difference here. So which of the following provides the best explanation for our conclusion? Well, let's see here. First off, it should work, right? Um, so let's kind of go with, I think it's reasonable. Uh, a, B, and C all say it's not reasonable to conclude, conclude the difference. Let, let's see what A says. It says it's not reasonable to conclude the difference in sales was caused by the different cover designs because this was not an experiment. Well, no, this certainly was an experiment. 35 stores were given one thing. 35 stores were given another thing. So this is definitely an experiment. So that's not going to be our answer. B says it's not reasonable to conclude the difference in sales was caused by the different cover designs because there was no control group for comparison. You don't always need a control group. Control groups aren't a must in an experiment. What are you gonna have a CD design cover that's just blank and see if anybody's gonna buy it but they don't even know what's in it? That just sounds silly. So we're simply comparing cover one to cover two. We don't need a control group. 
C says it's not reasonable to conclude that the difference in sales was caused by the different cover designs because the 70 stores were not randomly chosen. Okay, that's a good point, but we have to understand something. Yes, the 70 stores were not randomly chosen, but of the 70, which got cover one, which got cover two, that was random. That was random. And because of that level of random of randomness, we can show a cause and effect relationship. Okay, we can show that there is a significant difference. Now, what we cannot do is generalize our results to all stores across the entire country because we didn't randomly select the 70 stores from all stores across the entire country. So we could still make a reasonable conclusion because we did have that random assignment, but we will not be able to generalize. And the question's not asking us, can we generalize? That's, you know, could be a different question, but it's not what they're asking here. So D says, it is reasonable to conclude the difference in sales was caused by the different cover designs because the cover designs were randomly assigned to stores. And literally, that's literally what I just said. So that's gonna be our answer there. And then E says, it is reasonable to conclude the difference in sales was caused by the different cover designs because the sample size was large. No, we never talked about a sample size being large as being the number one indicator of if, if we could show a cause and effect relationship. So the answer to this question is D, pretty good problem. All right, next question. The manager of a public swimming pool wants to compare the effectiveness of two laundry detergents, detergent A and detergent B, in cleaning the towels they are used daily. At as each dirty towel is turned in, it is placed into a only washing machine on the premises. When the washing machine contains 20 towels, the manager flips a coin to determine whether detergent A or detergent B will be used for that load. The cleanliness of the load of towels is rated on a scale of 1 to 10 by a person who does not know which detergent was used. The manager continues this experiment for many days. So maybe on day one, he randomly gets those 20 towels put into the washing machine and he flips a coin and detergent A is used. In day two, maybe detergent A is used again. In day three, maybe detergent B is used. But again, every single day, he's going to dump 20 towels into the washing machine and randomly determine which detergent is going to be used. So you assumed after a large amount of days, he's gonna have some A's and some B's, maybe not necessarily even amount, but some A's and some B's. So which of the following best describes the manager's study? A says a randomized design. B says a block design with detergent A and B as the blocks. No, A and B are our, 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 our treatments, right? We, we don't block on treatments. We block on another variable that we're concerned could impact the results. So that's not how we block at all. So that's not correct. C says a randomized block design with the washing machine as the block. Well, if we had two washing machines, then that would make sense to have two blocks. So do an experiment for washing machine and then another experiment for the other washing machine. But it said we only had one washing machine on premises, so it can't block when you only have one thing. A matched pairs design with detergent A and detergent B as a pair? No. You pair subjects together, and then one of them gets A and one of them gets B. So if we were like taking two towels that were both similarly dirty, one got A, one got B, that could be a matched pair design, but we don't match based on the treatment, so that's incorrect. E says an observational study. No, that means we were just watching what was happening. We weren't, we weren't putting detergent into some and putting a different detergent to others. So definitely not an observational study because there we weren't allowed to interact with the towels at all. So the best answer here is going to be a completely randomized design. Uh, most kids get a little bit scared about this question because they're like, well, all the towels could get A because they're just flipping a coin. And yeah, but that would be weird. Like over multiple days. It's, it would be unlikely to get heads every single time, which means we get A every single time. So at the end of the day, or at the end of many days, we should have some towels with A and some towels with B that we can make a good comparison here. So the best answer to this question is a completely randomized design. So we had the towels and some got A, some got B. Simple as that. All right, next question says, in the design of a survey, which of the following best explains how to minimize response bias? So first, let's make sure we know what response bias is. So response bias is when the response from your subjects or the response from the people surveyed are not truthful for any reason. So you get responses, but they're not truthful for any reason. So A says we could fix this by 
increasing the sample size? Well, if we have bad questions or if we have a bad survey that's going to cause people to lie to us and we ask more people, we're just going to get more lies. So increasing the sample size is not going to work. Decreasing the sample size, uh, that's not going to work either because a smaller samples are not going to be as good as bigger samples. So, okay, we could decrease the sample size, but if we're still getting lies or bad responses, then a small sample is going to give us bad responses too. So randomly select the sample. Okay, now it is important to always randomly select your sample, but that's not what this question is asking about. It's asking about how to avoid response bias. Yes, randomly selecting a sample is a good thing, but if you have a question that's going to cause somebody to lie, even if the person was selected randomly, they're still going to lie to you. D says, increase the number of questions in the survey. Okay, once again, part of response bias is when your questions are bad and they cause people to lie. Well, if I have more questions, I'm just going to get more wrong answers that are lied to me. That's not going to work either. E, carefully word and field test the survey questions. There's your answer, right? If you want to get the best results, make sure that you have really good questions that are not going to cause somebody to lie to you for any reason. They're very carefully worded. And again, it's a smart idea to test them to make sure that you good, good, accurate results. All right, a polling firm is interested in surveying a representative sample of registered voters in the United States. The firm has automated its sampling so that random phone numbers within the United States are called. Each time a number is called, the procedure below is followed. If there is no response or even if an answering machine is reached, another number is automatically dialed. If a person answers, a survey worker verifies that the person is 18 or older. If the person is not at least 18 years of age, no response is recorded and another number is called. And finally, if the person is at least 18 years of age, then the person surveyed. Okay, so they call the house randomly, and if nobody answers, they move on. If somebody answers and they're under 18, they move on. And if somebody answers that's over 18, then they're surveyed. Some people claim that this procedure being used does not permit the results to be extended to all registered voters. Which of the following is not a legitimate concern about the procedure being used? It's really important that we're choosing the one that's not a legitimate concern. All right, A says registered voters with children under the age of 18 may be underrepresented in this sample. That is true. That is a legitimate concern. Okay, we're choosing the one that's not. Why is that a legitimate concern? Because if I live in a house with, say, four children under the age of 18, then that means that if my house is called, they might answer it. And if they answer it, then they're going to immediately hang up and move on. And I, having multiple children under the age of 18 in my house, is now going to be underrepresented because I never got a hold of it because my kid answered the phone and they said, are you 18? Kid said no, and they hung up. So that could potentially be a problem. B says registered voters with unlisted telephone numbers may be underrepresented in this sample. Now, typically we think that that's a problem, unlisted telephone numbers. But I'm actually going to come back to that one. Not, not going to lie to you here, but this the, the answer is B, but I really want to come back and explain why. Now, C said registered voters who have more than one telephone number may be overrepresented in the sample. That is a legitimate concern. If I have more than one telephone number, that means that I'm more likely to be contacted, which means I'm overrepresented in the sample. That could be a problem with this method. D, registered voters who live in households consisting of more than one voter may be underrepresented. Yeah, imagine that you live in a house where you got your husband, wife, maybe grandma, grandpa live there, and maybe a, a sister or a brother lives there that's over the age of 18. So basically, if multiple people in that house are registered voters, well, they're only calling that house and they're only talking to one of them. They're not going to talk to all of them so the other people get underrepresented because they never got a chance to be talked to. And then E says people who are not registered to vote may bias the sample results. That is a legitimate concern. Part of their process never addressed the fact, okay, you're over 18, but are you a registered voter? Because if you're not a registered voter, why am I even going to ask you this question? They never addressed that. So people who are not registered that get surveyed could end up biasing the results. So the correct answer here is B. B is not a legitimate concern. Now some people would say, well, well wait a minute, why? If I have an unlisted phone number, I'm never going to be contacted. Yes, that's a great point. Totally understand it. 
but it says which is not a legitimate concern with this procedure. And this procedure is set by automatically dialing any random telephone numbers. So even if yours is unlisted, if it's just dialing random phone numbers, you could still be contacted. So you being unlisted isn't gonna make it impossible for them to contact you because they're dialing random phone numbers. So B is the one that's not a legitimate concern. So lots going on here, it's a really good problem, a lot of reading that you have to do to understand that one, but hopefully my explanation made sense. All right, an independent polling agency was hired to track the preferences of registered voters in a district for an upcoming election. The polling agency divided the district into 20 regions and believes that the regions are similar to one another in their composition. The agency then randomly selected two of the regions and surveyed all registered voters in both regions, which of the following best describes the sampling method used for the polling agency. All right, so first off, let's understand, because this is a very common question, choosing between convenience, simple, random, stratified, systematic, cluster. All right, so they're interested in registered voters, right? So if this was a simple random, they would have a list of all the registered voters and they'd pick you know, X amount of them randomly off that list. They did not do that, so it's definitely not simple random. Now, convenience would be that they did something that's out of convenience that's not random at all. They definitely selected two of these random regions, so there was some aspect of randomness here, so it's not convenience. Systematic is when we're going to get our registered voters and maybe select every 5th or every 10th or every 20th that's in some kind of line. That's not happening here at all. So we're down between the two that most people debate about, stratified and cluster. Now, they both involve grouping, right? But stratified is when you break into groups and then you select some from each group. That's not what they did here. They broke them into 20 groups. They broke the population into 20 groups. They determined that the 20 regions, the 20 groups, were all pretty similar. So if they're all pretty similar, it doesn't matter which one gets picked. And then they randomly picked two of those regions and all voters in those regions were selected. That is literally the definition of a cluster sample. Again, stratified, you break into groups. So if it said, hey, we broke into 20 regions and we took 10 people from each region, from each region, from each group, that would be the stratified. But in this case, we had these 20 clusters. Each cluster was similar to the other, as it said. So at that point, it doesn't matter which cluster gets picked. We randomly pick two of them. That's going to be a lot faster and easier to do. That's definitely going to be a cluster sample. Pretty good problem there as well. All right, and the last question here, an experiment was designed to investigate the relationship between the dosage of a certain migraine medication and the amount of time until relief from the headache was experienced. Four doses were used, 2.5, 5.0, 7.5, and 10, of the medication. The 20 participants in the experiment were known to experience migraines. Each participant was randomly assigned to one of the four dosages. So 20 people, four dosages, that means there's going to be five at each of these different dosages and they were randomly selected to go into each one. When the participants experienced a migraine, they took the assigned medication to record the number of minutes it took to experience relief from the headache. The number of minutes it took each group to experience the relief was compared. What were the experimental units in the experiment? Okay, a lot of reading for the easiest question ever. What are the experimental units? The experimental units are the people, animals, objects that actually get the treatment. So these would be the 20 participants. The 20 participants were the ones that actually got the treatments. Such an easy question. But let's actually talk about what these other choices are. A says the number of minutes to experience relief. That would be the response variable. That's what they were measuring at the end. That's the response variable. B is the mean number of minutes it took each group to experience relief. That's going to be the statistic. The statistic that they're actually going to compare at the end is the mean from each of the group. That's not the experimental units. C is the four dosages. Those would be the treatments, right? The factors, the treatments, what each person got. And then E says the relationship between the dosage and the amount of time. And of course, that's going to be what they're going to analyze at the end is did a certain dosage have a shorter amount of time or longer amount of time? But the experimental units in the problem, pretty easy question, are the 20 participants. All right, so again, I really want to emphasize before we end the video that there are so many topics in Unit 3 of AP Statistics over collecting data. And, you know, good news, they're not all going to be on the exam, but bad news is there's a lot of them that you need to understand. And just by going over these couple multiple choice questions from a previous release exam does not cover all of them because, again, they're not all going to be covered on the AP exam this year either, but a lot of them will. So the more you review them, the more you understand them, that way if something 
something does come up, you'll be prepared for it. And if something doesn't come up, oh well. All right, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. See you in the next one.